Okay, so wel welcome back everyone. Our next speaker up is Morgan Marquis-Boir. He's a security researcher and working for Google in Zurich. And um, today he'll be presenting as headhunter though as to provide us with a little more decent information about <laughs> OSX, malware, and incident response. Thank you, Mark. Go. Oh. Ooh. Hey. Um, so, hi to everybody. Um, some of you guys might have met me before, seen me at other cons. I was here in Vienna last year for DeepSec, actually. And I was in PlumberCon earlier this year in Vienna as well. So I'm pleased to be back. And I'd like to thank Mika and Lynx and the DeepSec organizing crew for bringing me here. Um, so I'm here today to talk about OSX security issues, uh, sort of primarily incident response, malware, and forensics. But before I begin, a uh, brief disclaimer. Um, the term hacker, when I talk about hackers, I mean evil hackers or people who break into computers, not whatever creative open source types, etc. Also, this talk contains some vendor-related criticisms, and for obvious reasons, I am going to be really vague in some parts. Um, if you have issue with this, you can discuss this with me afterwards, and I might get less vague. Depends. Uh, so, I um, Apple products. I like Apple products. I'm not I'm not blind to their faults, but they're they're cool. Uh, the interoperability is pretty amazing. They're super shiny, and there's the power of Unix underneath it all. So according to basis of probability, I'd say a good proportion of people in this room probably at least have iPods. Um, at least 10% of you will be using OS X. And probably a lot of people here have iPhones of some gen. Um, Apple's done pretty well for itself, actually, over the last couple of years. Uh, apart from the ascendancy of iPod and iPhone, um, OS X itself has become a lot more popular since they moved from PowerPC architecture to Intel. Um, PPC is cool, and I like it a lot, but, but Intel has made things a lot easier for people to dual boot, write code, port stuff. I mean, you can now like triple boot your OS X box with like Linux and Windows. And so this has led to this, uh, which is the rise of the market share of OS X operating systems in the Intel period. Um, as you can see, the switch to Intel architecture has more than doubled their market share. Uh, as of May this year, according to Net Applications, um, who apparently had a sample of 160 million users, that's sort of roughly 10% of users using OS X. And from this easily observable trend, uh, it looks like it's on the rise. So, and something that basically mirrors this, here's the iPhone market share. Um, now, this market share hovers on about three quarters of a percent. Now, if you don't think three quarters of a percent in the mobile market is very much, consider the competition. Android's got about 0.08%, Symbian is 0.07, Windows Mobile 0.05, RIM 0.03. So all of them combined equals about one third of the iPhone market share. So it's probably about this point that you're wondering why the hell I'm showing you market graphs. Um, and that's because it's directly related to the amount of OS X boxes out there being compromised. Like, no one can be bothered writing rootkits, malware, or even forensics tools or antivirus for an operating system which no one uses. Um, so before we actually forge on with that thought, let's have a brief look at this actual operating system. So here's a hideously colored diagram um, which shows how OS X is built uh, with a series of layers on top of a Xenu kernel and a Darwin operating system core. And on top, you've got the Aqua interface and the GUI applications. So it, it feels a lot like FreeBSD uh, with a GUI that's pumped up on expensive synthetic steroids. Um, so as a rule, code written for BSD will compile and work without incident, as will a, a lot of Linux tools. Now, there's, there's a bunch of interesting weirdness going on under the hood. Um, and that's, that's with the Xenu kernel, which is a hybrid of both Mark and BSD kernels. Now, they, they have different fundamental executing units, uh, sort of BSD processes versus Mark threads, and they have different security models, uh, sort of process ownership versus port rights. And this has led to an interesting bunch of privilege escalation issues over the years. However, it's not just at these low layers that OSX differs a lot from other Unices. Uh, it has a bunch of interesting functionality that OSX zealots know and love. Um, so if you're an OSX fan at all, you'll probably be familiar with all of these. 
Uh, Non-OS6 users, at the very least, would be familiar with the Safari browser. Um, the .Mac, which was their online email backup syncing offering. Uh, Bonjour, which is their zero configuration networking protocol used with iTunes and so forth. Um, it all probably makes sense to you guys. So let's, let's look at a couple of these features in, in a little bit more depth. Um, Time Machine creates a folder on the external hard drive, performs automated incremental backups. You can restore from different points in time. It's very shiny. There's a time capsule appliance, uh, which is probably the nicest looking backup appliance that I've seen. Uh, time Machine is a win for a forensic analyst because you have a backup of all sorts of data across time that you can compare, contrast with the current system state. Um, so if you suspect the box is compromised now, you can go look at it a week ago, two months ago. This is good. Makes things easier. Target disk mode. This is also a win. I like it. Uh, when a Mac that supports targeted disk mode is booted with T held down, operating system doesn't load. Uh, firmware enables the drives to behave as BioWire mass storage devices. So a Mac booted in targeted disk mode can be attached to the FireWire port of a Mac or PC, appears as an external FireWire device, and the hard drives can be formatted, partitioned, uh, and this makes imaging and data acquisition for forensic investigation really easy. DMG files. So this is a disk image format. Um, it can allow for password protection, file compression. Its most common functionality is the distribution of software. Uh, when open, DMG files get mounted as a drive within Finder. Now, this shouldn't be that much of a problem, but unfortunately can be a bit of a drag to mount some DMGs in other operating systems. Uh, it does have a handy mode for DMG investigation, which is the dash shadow option. Um, and this is basically like snapshotting for a DMG file. So this option allows you to poke around with the original image and all your changes get written to an out file as opposed to actually changing the image at all. Um, so blocks read from the image, blocks present in the shadow file override the blocks in the base image, um, and all data written to attached device direct to the file. It's very handy. This is a very cool feature. Uh, what we see here is if you have a look at a binary on OS X, you'll see the Mac O universal binary, it's to architecture. So it'll run on both PPC and x86, which is awesome. Um, it's great for compatibility. You take a bit of a hit in size, but it's definitely worth it. So this isn't really a problem in itself, but it's more a problem with doing forensics on PPC architecture. There's very few tools for PPC. And I recently had the misfortune of actually having to deal with an incident which happened involving a PPC Mac. And the first thing I discovered is a bunch of stuff that I would normally use didn't work because I didn't have a tool set for the platform. Um, the cross-compilation tool chain isn't something that's that hard to build, but is a bit of a colossal drag when you're in the middle of an incident. And so I did some searching around for PPC tools, and I basically found two answers, uh, which is that you can use the Ubuntu PPC Live CD um, and do everything manually, which is not so great, but it, it works. Um, or there's a company called Forward Discovery which provides a Live CD called Raptor Forensic which is unfortunately in beta and is very, very beta. Um, after you've got a disk image, then you can do whatever it is you would normally do. You can load things up in either an end case if Windows is your poison or Sleuth Kit and Autopsy and Linux or whatever. Um, now, you'd think this would mean a lack of malware for the PPC platform, but you'd be wrong. Um, just because there's a lot of platform independent malware going on out there. Uh, like DNS Changer is a good example, which used a series of obfuscated scripts when you installed the DNG to alter DNS entries. And all of a sudden, you're being directed to pornographic websites and so forth. Uh, but we'll, we'll get to that soon. Um, plist files are another OSX specificity. Um, they perform a similar function to the Windows registry and used to store user settings. Um, you store information about bundles, applications, used to be served by the resource fork in old OS X, but um, these files come either in XML or binary format, and Apple provides a handy property list editor for viewing either of them, and also a tool for converting between them. Um, this shouldn't really be classed as a negative. Um, the plist structure isn't particularly arcane. There are some files that can look a bit odd, but in general it's okay. However, there's still a bunch of tools out there that parse plist files really, really badly and actually provide either confusing or incorrect information. And I'll get to that soon as well. Uh, FileVault 
is very cool. Uh, Transparent encryption for user's home door. This is a good security measure. You click a button, your home door is encrypted, and it's pretty much invisible to you. This is security that everyone's parents can use. Um, these are mounted or unmounted when the user logs in or out of the system. Uses strong cryptography, master passwords that can be decrypted in the event of a password. Um, used to use sparse images, but now use a new format known as sparse bundle. And this breaks up the encrypted image into a bunch of bands, save space on disk. Encryption is traditionally the enemy of a forensic analyst. However, in this case, File Vault actually causes a lot more pain than a lot of other encryption solutions. It's really poorly supported uh, amongst off-the-shelf forensic tools. Many of them support mounting encrypted file systems, PGP, EFS, SGEZ, BitLocker. None of the ones that I have tried support File Vault, uh, which seems odd for a native feature in the second most popular commercial end-user OS in the world. I'll talk a little bit more about this when I cover forensic tools, but currently your best option for mounting a file vault is to use OSX itself. There's also incredibly poor documentation out there regarding acquiring and analyzing file vaults. There's a book out there which actually has the words forensics and OSX in the title that recommends mounting a file vault and then running cp-r on the file vault and just copying it to another directory. Um, and even says that this is the best way to acquire a file vault. This is wrong. Um, even tar would be a better idea which is also wrong, um, but OSS has a disk utility with a built-in imaging commands, like, seriously. Um, anyway, it's, it's not just the literature that can be really bad. The users are frequently not that much better. Um, OSX users tend to think that they somehow exist in a higher plane. Um, everyone has met the snobby Mac user. Um, they feel that they don't need to worry about security, that there's no malware for their platform, and that everything is great. Um, so, this is the basis, actually, of an OSX advertising campaign. Um, I'm sure everybody remembers this, where smug Apple fanboys get to run down their virus PC-ridden, you know, having friends. Um, I mean, OSX is a Unix based on NextStep and FreeBSD, right? It's got to be free of viruses? Well, it's time for a little home truth in that not only does OSX have viruses, they're here to stay, and Unix has had them too for a while. Um, so, the media and antivirus vendors got really worked up back in 1997 when they discovered there was such a thing as a Unix virus. Uh, virus source code was posted on a few sites and it needed to be byte swapped, U decoded, ROP13, blah, 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 in order to be used. Uh, this was called Bliss and it was an elf infector and it would detect binaries that it had write access to and then it would overwrite them with its own code. And it had really basic worm-like features in that it would look at EDC hosts to try to discover other hosts to try to infect. Um, it would disinfect itself if you ran the infected binary with the following command, like dash dash disinfect files, please. Um, yes, honor among thieves, I guess. <laughs> Viruses have obviously come a long way since then. Um, Having said that, vendor hype around this was a little bit misleading. Uh, there'd been sort of earlier efforts in the Unix virus world. There's actually an earlier virus called Staug, which used buffer overflows in mount and tip and a bug in setuid Perl to try to gain root. Um, this is a much earlier quote from Dennis Ritchie, one of the inventors of C and Unix. And this is where he talks about um, virus research on a bunch of VAX 750s. Um, basic elf binary infection here uh, in the Slack space at the end of executable um, and basically infecting other files that it has write access to. Uh, an Australian guy, Silvio Sari, did some excellent work about 10 years ago on the subject of elf binary infection. Uh, the technique that he discusses in a vastly simplified explanation is based on utilizing padding at the end of a text segment within an elf binary, uh, which is sort of a suitable area for hosting parasitic code. Uh, he also discusses the subsequent difficulties of evading detection when the entry point of your program is not in a normal section of the binary. Uh, this is all very cool stuff and worth reading, and it's actually a lot cooler than a lot of the OS X viruses that we see around today. Um, now, before I move on, actually, the, this actually displays a very good point, which is not that it's harder to write viruses for Unix than Windows. It's not, and it's not a technical problem. Uh, it's that deploying and spreading viruses is much easier under Windows than it is for Linux. And this is largely due to differences in privilege separation and wildly, wildly different user behavior. However, OS X 
the behavior of the average OS X user is much, much closer to that of a Windows user than that of a Linux user. Uh, OS X users pirate software, they download and run untrusted binaries from the internet. They need codecs to watch movies. They pirate the latest albums from torrent sites. The everyday use account probably has administrative privileges. Does all sound very familiar? Well, say hello to our new friends. So here's a bunch of names that you may or may not be familiar with. Uh, they range from proof of concept binary infector, messaging worm, Trojan downloader, concept art game, online poker password stealer, the last one on the list is actually Lady Gaga's new album. Um, a very mixed crew indeed. So let's have a run through them. Um, Mac Arena was 2006, November, caused a bit of a stir in the press at the time because Mac malware was so rare. Symantec was supplied with proof of concept code and it would infect by appending itself to mark Intel binaries. Um, now, only a source code of the worm was ever found. It turns out the author wasn't very happy with his worm. If you read, uh, it's really very buggy. Uh, so many problems for so little code. I'm not sure if this was ever actually found in the wild for these reasons. Now, the leap worm was definitely, definitely found in the wild, and this was actually a messaging worm which attempted to spread by iChat, and it would send itself to available contacts in the infected user's buddy list in a file called latestpix.tgz. Uh, it would install itself in an application by deleting the app hook dir in library input managers and replace the files you see above. And then it would attempt to infect recently used applications by overwriting them with a copy of itself and then storing the original file in the resource fork. Uh, this was pretty easy to detect because the infected files would have in the extended attributes name umpa value umpa. Um, Inkatana B was a Bluetooth worm. And this is an infected machine that looked for other Bluetooth enabled computers on startup. And the worm would attempt to propagate by copying itself onto other computers. It showed up as an OBEX push request requiring the user to accept a data transfer. When this was done, it would use a directory traversal exploit to copy its files so that it started when any app other application ran. This one has been in the news in the last couple of weeks, actually. Uh, it's the first really, really popular mobile worm, and it hit OS X, obviously due to the market share metric that we saw before. Um, this worm SSHs into jailbroken phones using the default password of Alpine and changes the lock background paper to an image of Rick Astley with the phrase, Ikey is never going to give you up. Um, <laughs> now, presently, apart from pseudo Rick rolling people, um, it doesn't really do much more malicious than spread and change the infected user's wallpaper. Uh, this is not a new idea or a new vulnerability, uh, but it has actually been manually exploited before, and rather amusingly, at the beginning of this month, there was a Dutch hacker who was owning people's phones, changing their wallpaper, which had a link to a site. When they go to the website, the website will demand five euro in return for releasing control of the phone. Uh, five, five euro. Is it just me or did hackers used to think bigger? But uh, iService, this is a very recent one as well. Uh, an interesting trend in malware for OS X, which makes total sense for virus writers, is providing Trojan versions of real packages for download. Um, the Windows malware scene has been doing this for quite some time, so it's logical to expect this. What's interesting is that a new technique is that there's a lot of viruses coming out which masquerade as packages which aren't ported to OS X yet. So your favorite PDF reader, there's an OS X version of it uh, that isn't available on the site, but it's available on Torrent, probably malware. Uh, in this case, though, this, the target software is a version of iWork 2009. Uh, disguised as a legitimate installer, it actually does contain iWork, but also some added extra functionality. Um, contains a Trojan executable named iWork Services, which is about 400K. It's a universal Marco binary, so it'll run on both PPC and Intel. Executed, it checks if it's root, uh, which it probably is because it's a malicious installer. If not, it closes, otherwise it copies itself to the following locations on your hard drive, and then adds itself to system library startup items to ensure it runs on the computer restarts. It acts as a backdoor, uh, opens a port on localhost for remote connections, um, and then it tries to connect to these two above hosts, which are hard-coded into the binary, which is kind of lame. Um, it's, it's kind of amazing how unconcerned OS X users are with the possibility of installing a Trojan package. Now, that's probably a bit small, but if you can read it, 
Um, he says, oh, if it's infected, you can just download a tool to remove the Trojan. Is this infected? Well, I'm not sure until you download it, but you know, someone might want to add a note to the torrent if it is or is not infected, or just follow the link at the end of this to remove. So this guy's basically advocating downloading and installing the packets regardless if it's Trojan or not, because you, know, you probably want your priority copy of iWork, right? Um, this one, RS plug F, or DNS changer, is one of the first pieces of OSX malware that gained really widespread attention. And this was sort of beginning of last year. And this was really basic. The install scripts were shell scripts, which once downloaded and installed, changed the DNS settings on the computer, redirecting websites um, to ones specified by the malicious controller. Um, and as you, if you can see down there, that's actually a really, really simple SCUtil script. Um, it was basically a social engineering trojan. Uh, it was found on numerous pornographic websites disguising itself as a video codec. Uh, what was interesting was the cross-platform nature of the malware and that it would detect what operating system you were using and then offer you the correct malware accordingly. So if you were using Windows, give you an executable. If you were using a DM OS X, it would hand you a DMG. And this technique worked really well. According to Trend Micro, uh, they estimated 3 million infected. They don't actually specify, so I'm assuming this is Windows and OS X. Uh, the guy writing this virus didn't stop there, actually. Uh, recently, he came up with something called JarLavD. Now, this was the first example of Unix malware that I personally encountered in the wild. Uh, for completely legitimate reasons connected to security research, I was browsing Chinese download sites, and I was informed that in order to view the contents of this page, I would need to upgrade my version of Flash. I was somewhat surprised, given that my version of Flash was naturally up to date, and two, that the site offered me a copy of the software. It didn't direct me to Adobe, but was like, well, here you go, have a copy of Flash. And I instantly assumed malware, but what was most surprising was that I was actually offered a DMG. Um, so given this unprecedented opportunity to look at some Unix malware, I decided that I'd sit down and do some analysis. And so I've got a copy of this and the other malware samples that I've been talking about. So if anyone wants to have a look and do their own analysis, they can come call me later and I'll hand out some malicious code. Um, so basically what I did is I mounted up this malicious installer, as you can see there, and the first thing we notice when we take a look at the contents of the DMG is that the pre-install and pre-upgrade script have the same size and date. And investigation reveals that they're actually the same script. If we have a look at the info plist in the root package of the directory, then we see the following metadata about it, um, about this bundle. If we look at the get info string, it's who cares, um, which is pretty suspicious for a package which is supposed to be Adobe Flash. I'm pretty sure that Adobe cares. Um, so, so let's have a look at these scripts. Don't worry if you can't read this, uh, because that's just a bunch of UU encoded data. For people here that haven't done a lot of Unix. UU encodings are binary to text form of encoding that originated with the UU encode program. Um, it was originally for transfer of data over the UUCP mail system. In these MIME days, we generally would use base64, but um, this guy obviously likes old school stuff, which I can respect. Um, when we de UU decode this script, we get a second script, which also has a bunch of UU decode data in it. Um, before that, though, in the shell script at the top, you'll notice that he actually installs himself into a cron job that runs every five minutes, um, and the job being to run the bogus Adobe Flash plugin from the Internet Plugins folder as a cron job. Um, this is in a, in a gzip CPIO archive, of all things, um, called archive.pax.gz, um, which contains the bogus Adobe Flash, which is another shell script, like the one we just analyzed, and the verified download plugin, which is actually your copy of Flash. So Flash will work after you install this. Um, if you unobfuscate the last shell script, then you get this Perl script, which connects to a remote host, gives information about the new compromised host, polls the remote host every five minutes, um, talks to this uh, Perl script called generator.pl, functionality download new copies, everything you'd expect. Uh, no DNS changing this time, a little bit more sophisticated. Um, as we can see, though, this is actually still a pretty simple virus. It's pretty easy to analyze and detect, especially when we know what we're looking for. Um, so as a rule, when it comes to the OSX viruses that I've discussed, they're reasonably simple. Uh, the difficulty of detection is, is generally low, and they're a lot less sneaky than Windows malware. So I mean, 
by virtue of comparison, I'd like to talk really briefly about one piece of Windows malware, uh, say Rust.c. And so in December 2006, rumors began to circulate among rootkit researchers that someone had created and released an absolutely undetectable rootkit, uh, which could not be detected on computers where it was active by any of the existing antivirus or rootkit solutions. Two years later, um, Dr. Webb announced that they had discovered a rootkit known as NTLoader and that it was the elusive Rust.c. Now, Kapersky began performing in-depth analysis of the rootkit's code on May 12 and discovered that it was not so simple. The entire code was encrypted using an unknown method, could not be analyzed using usual compressed code analysis and emulation techniques. Um, further complicating the issue, there was hardware binding um, to the infected computer such that the malware could not be executed or analyzed on other computers or even in virtual machines. Contained within this rootkit was advanced polymorphic protection, um, anti-anti rootkit technology in that it had specific code to ensure that existing anti-rootkit programs would not be able to run. Uh, it had effective firewall bypassing. Um, it was effective against kernel mode debugging and tracing. It was effective against signature-based detection methods and modern heuristics and dramatically slowed down reverse engineering process. Contained several layers of code morphing uh, which prevented tools like soft ice from working and wind debug was also completely impossible to use. So this is like not impossible to unpack and reverse, but incredibly difficult. Um, we just haven't come across this sort of thing yet for OS X. Um, and and this, is, this is pretty lucky, I guess. Um, and and uh, it, does, it does make OS X incident response easier, but not necessarily easy. Um, so, so let's talk a little bit about incident response in general, and I guess this will become sort of apparent to you as to why. So I've, I've been doing incident response um, and forensics now for uh, over half a decade, and I've found a, an interesting and rewarding area of security. And I'm sort of using incident response here as opposed to forensics because people frequently think that forensics is all about police finding naughty pictures on people's hard drives. Um, this is partially true. Uh, a large section of the forensic industry, and especially the tools that are created, is centered around acquisition of digital data to prosecute someone for committing what is actually a traditional crime committed by electronic means. So we're talking digital correspondence between two criminals detailing their crimes, uh, documentation proving some form of criminal behavior. Uh, child pornography gets a lot of attention. Um, you know, if all else fails, accuse people of corrupting the youth. Um, there's a lot of software that provides very fancy support for acquisition of digital images. So it will find images inside zip files, inside PST files, inside CAD files, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is pretty much not the sort of forensics that I'm talking about today. Um, what I'm interested in is the more traditional activities, I guess. I'm more interested in computer criminals than criminals that use computers. Uh, that is to say, traditional activities that'd be understood as hacking, um, unauthorized access, Frequently, the motivation prior to the age of spamming, scamming, and Russian business networks was theft of information. Um, we do, however, live in the age of the botnet, and one of the main causes of malicious code executed in any organization is malware. So the steps that I need to follow uh, involve detection of an actual incident, incident triage, which is assessment of the incident, containment procedures, etc., and then forensic analysis of potential evidence. So I'm going to run through forensics blazingly fast in one slide. Um, so I'm sure that most people more or less know what's going on. Um, so you've got evidence acquisition, which involves frequently digital imaging, be it taking an online or offline image of a potentially compromised host. Um, offline analysis is from media when the host is powered down, and this is frequently viewed as the most trusted way to acquire digital evidence. Online is when the machine is still running. Obviously, online has a bunch of benefits involving the acquisition of volatile data. Uh, you get memory, you get network sockets, you get running processes. Obviously, the problem with acquiring anything live via a running host that you suspect of being compromised is that the operating system can and frequently will lie to you. Um, if you can get offline and online images and compare them and you find notable differences, obviously this is a pretty useful detection method. Um, recovering deleted files is what people most commonly think of as digital forensics. Now, I've just discussed that. Um, 
Time, file system timeline analysis, looking at access times, modified times, create times, and trying to build up a coherent narrative of events which occurred during the incident. So that's correlating, say, a file system timeline with system logs, with browser history, with network events, with IDS, um, so you actually get an image of what a malicious attacker actually did. And then finally, stuff like keyword searches, like maybe you actually find a, uh, someone's email address hard-coded in a binary, and you can search a system for that. So. We could do all this verification and analysis by hand. However, after you've done this by hand the first time, this becomes a colossal drag. It's not feasible if you have thousands of hosts to look after. And if this is what you do day in, day out, and you're not a security consultant, uh, as in you're not charging people by the hour, then you probably want to optimize. If you are a consultant, then the longer things take, the better, because you can just watch the dollars roll in. But otherwise, we need tools to streamline things. Um, so antivirus is generally the first port of call for most organizations. And everyone knows that this ranges from totally useless to slightly useful. Um, however, nonetheless, it's probably the world's most prevalent security software. And one of the first things that someone generally does when they suspect an incident of occurring. Um, a rootkit and backdoor detection software is also generally pretty useful and used early on in incident response. Uh, rootkit finders will search the file system, kernel memory, logs, etc., for evidence of suspicious behavior. Um, and finally, forensic tools. And these are primarily used for evidence acquisition and file system analysis and are tools like NCASE, FTK, Helix, etc. So I'll look at these in a bit more detail. Um, so we've got a bunch of vendors. Um, and Unfortunately, as a lot of you guys will know, the standard of security software varies wildly. Like some of these products are exceptionally helpful. Some of these products are very, very poor. Um, about half the vendors out there in AV world offer OSX support. There's a few noticeable exceptions and some baffling ones. Um, FProt will do Windows, Linux, Solaris, IBM eServer, FreeBSD, but not OSX. However, Symantec, Sophos, Kapersky, McAfee, Avast, Clam AV, Dr. Webb, and Trend Micro all offer OSX AV products. I tested the majority of these and found some serious issues. Um, some of these just don't work. Uh, scans never finish. You can scan a laptop hard drive and find a scan never finishes. Like, it literally grind away and look like it's scanning and nothing really happens. Um, schedule scanning and on, on access enable scanning basically do nothing. Uh, further investigation of this has linked this with a couple of vendors' inability to handle file vault mounted home directories. Now, I'd say a failure to work with a native OS feature, uh, which you have a good expectation that a user might be using, uh, means that a product isn't really market ready and should be marked as beta. For products that did work, I found that more than a couple had scan speeds that I would describe as slower than acceptable, detection rates that were definitely subpar. So I performed some testing with a virus sample of 60,000 viruses loaded up on an OSX host, had a single user with a file fault home directory. Uh, a couple of the scanners had detection rates of around 85%. Uh, so that involves leaving about 8,000 pieces of malware undetected on a host. Um, I'd say 8,000 pieces of undetected malware is unacceptable and probably not what you're looking for in an antivirus. Uh, that's not to say all OSX AV sucks, but you should actually be pretty careful when you decide on a product because quality actually varies wildly. Uh, if you want a recommendation from me on this, I am happy to give you one afterwards. Um, there's been some quite decent work done in the area of OSX rootkits. Uh, the first couple that came to my attention in the wild were uh, Rinopo, which is openness spelled backwards. And this wasn't really a fully fledged rootkit. This was just a script in three binaries. Uh, it added a new user to the system, disabled the firewall, tried to turn off a little snitch if you were running it, installed John the Ripper, created a hidden directory for your password hashes, uh, copied itself into system library startup items. It's basically an old school user land kit, um, which is you know, very nice for time and the place. Quite simple, though. Um, the, whoa, the Whipox rootkit showed up around 2K5 and installed pretty well on Tiger. It's heavily based on the Adore BSD kit, for those of you that actually follow rootkits, which is quite a popular one, uh, which isn't surprising given that there's a lot of BSD at the heart of OSX. Now, the kit hooked uh, set UID, kill, write, and chmod functions, and it contains hooks for a couple of other routines, like get durian trees, but these appear to be incomplete. 
uh, which is probably due to the difficulties the guy had with working with the Xenu kernel, as I described before. As I mentioned before, the hybrid nature of Mark and BSD causes a lot of traditional Unix interfaces uh, to not be fully functional or even unavailable, and so there's a lot of equivalence instead. Um, like the ptrace debugging interface is actually a really good example of this. Uh, anyway, this, this, this rootkit um, provided privilege escalation functionality via the hooked kill function. If a signal was sent to a process of value 1337, then it would elevate privileges to root. Um, a hooked write function meant that if values that were on the don't show list, like, i.e. like a list of ports or something, was going to be displayed to standard out by a netstat or who, these values simply got discarded. Um, Dino Dizovi recently kicked up the OSX rootkit game a notch. Um, this year, actually, he did a talk at Black Hat called Advanced OSX Rootkits. And a couple of years ago, he did a talk on hypervisor rootkits that he called Vitriol. Uh, they're both good talks, and if you're really interested in it, I recommend you get a copy of the Mac Hacker's Handbook, which actually has a rundown on how to write rootkits for OSX. Um, so while the majority of OSX kits sort of um, employ BSD techniques, um, his presentation covered a number of Mark techniques, and he released some kind of interesting tools uh, which you could use via his inject bundle tool, which has all the necessary steps in order to inject something into the running memory process. Uh, now, the bundles that he provided were quite cool. There's one which allows you to capture stuff from someone's eyesight camera, uh, log instant messages from iChat, and log SSL traffic sent through the um, Apple Secure Transport API. Um, he also demonstrated uh, in kernel RPC server injection modification and some kernel rootkit detection. Um, this is the Uncloak tool that he had, uh, which examines kernel memory regions looking for Mark O loaded objects. If any of these objects, things you don't like, um, then you can dump them to disk using kernel Mark O dump. The other rootkit detector, which is widely available for OSX, is called OSX Rootkit Hunter and is basically a port of Linux's RK Hunter. Uh, it's not bad, but the majority of the rootkits it looks for are Linux rootkits, and it's still pretty basic. And this is more or less all we have in this area. Uh, fortunately, I haven't seen a lot of incidents involving OS X rootkits um, in the wild. There's been a few, but I'm reasonably convinced that soon malware writers will discover OS X rootkit techniques, and then detection will become a lot more interesting. Um, a pretty reasonable method of detection that we've been using for a while is, is hashing. Um, and this is a pretty powerful tool with a lot of applications. Frequently in forensics, you use it to check whether or not key files have been changed by some sort of malicious attacker. Um, blacklisting is the practice of disallowing bad binaries that are known bad. Uh, it's useful, but has the problem of the fact that we can obviously only stop stuff that we know to be bad or detect stuff that we know to be bad. Uh, whitelisting, on the other hand, is much better in that we only allow what we know to be good, but that actually has significant overhead. Um, if you're smart, then you'll have a hash of all your files on your system stored on read-only media before you get compromised so you can compare in case of a suspected incident. However, this isn't always feasible, but fortunately various organizations provide large hash lists for us. Um, Bit9 provides commercial MD5 and SHA-1 database, which is huge and really handy for your Win32 infrastructure. Unfortunately, it's pretty slim on the ground when it comes to OSX stuff. That is to say, there's pretty much none. Um, NSRL is a hash database provided by NIST, which is a US government body. Again, it's awesome that they've done this work putting it together and that it's provided, but the latest database has OSX hashes for six out-of-date versions of iWorks, Keynote on OSX 10.2, and a version of QuickTime for Windows. Um, there used to be a website called Known Goods, which was provided by the Shmoo Group, uh, which was really useful and actually did provide a good online database of OSX hashes as well as FreeBSD and other things, but unfortunately the Shmoo Group stopped maintaining it. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about forensic tools now. Like the Sleuth Kit uh, is a fantastic tool, and full credit to uh, guys that wrote it. Uh, it is the standard tool for performing forensic analysis and that it's free. So if anyone in the audience who's not a professional has done any, this is probably what they've used. It's good for file system timelining, uh, hidden data, file recovery, file carving. It does work on OS X, although they classify their HFS support still in beta and it's not compiled in by default. Uh, if you do professional forensics, this is probably what you use. In cases widely considered to be the premier forensic software available. Uh, used by law enforcement and government, provides acquisition, advanced image recovery, case processing, 
It'll find suspicious activity for you, um, analyze the registry, tell you what's supposed to start on boot, etc., etc. All sorts of interesting functionality. There's even a forensics joke that if you want to avoid getting caught, then you should use RiserFS as your operating system because NCase doesn't support it and therefore the cops won't be able to analyze what you're doing. Um, unfortunately, in case the supported office for OSX is considerably less advanced than the supported office for Windows, and this has been the case for quite a long time, uh, despite the fact that it supports a variety of encryption formats, like I mentioned before, PGP, BitLocker, EFS, etc., doesn't support FileVault. Uh, this is pretty annoying um, when much of the activity that is of interest to you occurs inside a user's home directory. Having to take a copy of the sparse bundle bands, load them up on an OSX box, then attempt to cross-correlate the information you've gained from NCase um, is seriously painful. And while it offers certain processing abilities, like it tries to tell you what services start on boot, uh, I would describe this support as probably alpha or beta at best. Um, like the process lists it provides are at first baffling, and then when you look at them, they can actually frequently be incorrect. Um, FDK3 is doing some really clever work, and they've put some effort into OSX features for version 3 of their software. Um, there's good support for a lot of specialized file formats, metadata, uh, plist files, good viewer for it. They even support cracking FileVault passwords, but unfortunately, they don't actually support mounting FileVault bundles. Um, Helix, Forensic Live CD, been around for a long time. Uh, used to be free, gone commercial, and they provide static binaries, forensic imaging, they acquire memory, gather volatile data, but not on OS X. Uh, OS X is pretty much an acquisition only proposition and all the extra functionality exists for Windows. Um, volatility is a totally awesome tool and it provides extraction capability for memory samples and it'll presently allow you to image memory, uh, remove running processes, network sockets, network connections, DILs for loaded processes, it'll allow you to open files for each process, list registry handles for each process, to, uh, processes addressable memory, kernel modules, etc. And it says it has OS X support on the site and I got very enthused but what this means is that it will run on OS X, not acquire or analyze OS X memory images. Uh, and a big part of this is the lack of a memory acquisition driver for OS X. Um, so after the acquisition, there's actually a bunch of work to be done on parsing memory structures and presenting it in a meaningful format. Um, and this difficulty in getting a copy of memory means that we lose a lot of really important volatile data that's exceptionally useful. There's a few different projects and people that have started doing something in this area, but nothing public has actually come of it yet. Uh, there's also a tool called Memorize by Mandiant, which does something similar. Again, uh, Windows only. Um, there's some other OSX software I, out there that I looked at, but they were either in between products and not available to provide me with a sample, or they had such restrictive NDAs that I can't talk about them. Um, OSX support, as you can see on a lot of forensic tools, leaves a lot to be desired, uh, especially when it comes to any real artifact processing or analysis. Um, there's a lot of tools to help you acquire evidence, but very few to help you deal with it in a meaningful way when you have it. Um, so what, why, do we, why do we really care about any of these problems? Uh, and it's, it's largely because there's, there's more Macs, which means there's more malware, which means there's more owned Macs. Um, and if you do a lot of incident response and you have to end up doing incident response for OS X, if it's part of your company's fleet, uh, then you're going to get really irritated um, that the tools available for OS X fall well, well behind what you'd expect. Um, so you can say, come to me with solutions and not problems. Um, and there has been some work done in the area of providing a tool which will allow for better specific extraction of information and more automated analysis of said information, but getting this to public release is still in progress, so watch this space. Um, so some final words i take with you is that um, obviously OS X is not invulnerable and your OS X users are easily as stupid as your Windows users, if not worse in some ways because they believe that they're invulnerable. There will be a lot more OS X users and OS X malware. Uh, it's become enough of a mainstream OS that we're getting people owning it not just by hand but in an automated method with malware. Um, so it's probably a good idea to think about your approach now. Um, rather than consider the OS X part of your fleet is immune to security risks, consider how you'll deal with the threat when it happens and get your tools in order before it does. Uh, because as soon as malware actually steps up its game and OS X malware stops being basic and incorporates some of the root technology we've got, we will actually have serious problems probably sometime within the next year or so. So that's me.
Does anyone have any questions? If you're feeling shy or secretive, then, oh, well, you're not. <laughs> uh, what's your experience uh, with, res with, with reporting bugs to Apple compared to other vendors? Um, I probably shouldn't comment on that on camera, um, just for obvious reasons. I'm happy to talk about it in my personal capacity, but I, I wouldn't want to comment on Apple as a company. Um, but over a beer, you know, we'll get together and bitch about how crap they are. Um, I'm joking. They're, they're all good. <laughs> um, anyone else? Any further as, as I said, if anyone's feeling secretive, then we can always talk about stuff over a drink later on. But If nobody else has any more questions, I might ask a very last question. Uh, so Morgan, what is the most interesting or outstanding piece of malware you've ever come across? Um, there's, there's one that's actually on that list, um, which, as I said, qualifies as malware according to most malware vendors, but is actually a concept art game, um, which some of you guys might have heard of, called Lose Lose. And that was classified as social engineering malware. And, and what it does is it actually, you run through an alien landscape with a gun and every alien you see is a representation of a file on your hard drive. And when you shoot the alien, the file on your hard drive gets deleted. If you get hit by an alien, the application is deleted. So the idea is the game is supposed to pose a moral question as to whether or not if you have a gun, you should use it, or whether or not you're just supposed to be an observer in a potentially hostile land, um, which is definitely uh, an interesting moral question. but. Sophos and Semantic were not amused and just slapped it with social engineering malware. Uh, but, yeah. Um, so, I'll provide the slides later. This was a bunch of stuff that I used in order to research the talk and tools that I think are decent. So, yeah, thanks. Thank you.